see if I can move forward the presentation here. So this is uh, like a really small bit of Ms. Reich's scholarship in Spain. Uh, the very first and big publication was uh, made by Jose Ramon Melida, who was the archaeologist who was working on Merida. He was the very first one to publish the recent finds in Cerro de San Albin, which is like a, a small hill uh, that people began to dig because they wanted to build uh, a bullfighting rig. Uh, a bullfighting arena. So uh, it, it's very uh, surprising that, you know, a bullfighting arena was to be uh, built in a Mithraic uh, deposit. Um, so those were portraitors' finds. Uh, they were just by chance. Uh, so we don't have a very well recorded uh, stratigraphic study fieldwork of that because uh, they were just found. We don't have enough information. We know that some architectonic remains were found, but we don't have much information about it. We know that there were some frescoes in that. Uh, we know that lots of sculpture came up. Um, we do have the order in which they were found, but we don't know the exact location. So it's really hard to study uh, this uh, deposit or site. Uh, however you want to call it. And another reason it was hard to study this deposit was because uh, very close to Cerro de San Alvin was uh, a necropolis. So it was hard to say, okay, this is part of, of the temple, or this is part of the necropolis, or uh, this is part of something else we don't know. And because of the different iconographic examples that I'm going to show you later on, uh, it was hard to say, okay, is this just Mithraic or is this some sort of syncretic uh, oriental divinity temple? Um, so it's it's very interesting and it's a very rich site. Um, and then we have Antonio García Bellido, uh, who was the, the very first massive uh, systemization of all the finds in Hispania. Uh, because he also added, uh, for example, inscriptions and the uh, tauroctonies and some altars that were found in Betica, in Andalusia. And the, the, the problem with this publication is that uh, because of what was understood of the cult at that time, um, perhaps not enough female divinities uh, were included in the catalogue. And um, there was also a problem uh, in the, well, not a problem, but an issue in the Jaime Alvarez Guerra publication, uh, when, for example, he uh, takes away uh, a small bust of Mithras, which was portrayed as a, um, in a fitting for a carriage. And he says it's not part of the Mithraic cult because it's not a cultic play, it's not a cultic part, it's not part of the temple, it didn't receive devotion, it was just um, decorating a, a carriage fitting. Um, and there's also an issue of the inscriptions, uh, Alvarez Carra emphasizes a lot on, on inscriptions and uh, the historic development of the cult, whether it's just Mithras or is it Sol Invictus or is it some sort of uh, mixture of both. Um, there is a really good uh, example of analysis of iconography when it comes to uh, the publication of Manuel Vendala Galán, uh, because he he understands the phenomenon of the cult, uh, but he wants to focus on the iconography. He knows that it's the material culture that has the key uh, to to unlock uh, the the mysteries of the cult, if you want to put it in that way. And he tries to make sense of some of the sculptures in many that, which I think it's a big move forward for the uh, for the discipline in Hispania. And then we have uh, two um, end of the career doctoral dissertations by Julio Munoz Garcia Vaso and Maria Antonia Francisco Casado, uh, which somehow um, again try to, let's say, um, accompany the, the writings of Alvar and Garcia y Bellido 
Uh, they tried to update it a bit, but there was not much information. Uh, it was the 80s. Uh, there was no internet. Um, networking with other colleagues from other parts of Europe was much harder than today. That is what we can do now. Um, so when it was my turn to write my PhD dissertation, I decided to update the catalogue of, uh, of Mithraic finds emphasizing not so much on inscriptions because I'm not a philologist, uh, I'm an archaeologist, my background is in art and archaeology, so I wanted to make an emphasis on the material culture uh, of the cult and what we have, what we really have, not what we think we might have, uh, because another problem of adding or taking away from the catalog of Mithraic uh, cult in, in Hispania was the fact that some objects were um, associated with a Mithras cult just because something Mithraic was already found nearby. So there, sometimes there is not a direct connection, there's not many inscriptions uh, surfacing right now. Uh, we do have two massive finds and discoveries uh, that I'm going to talk in a minute. Uh, but just, I think that it was necessary to upgrade and update the interpretations, especially when it came to um, iconography. So this is a little map of the finds of uh, Mithras cult in Hispania. Um, you have here the key on the left. So everything in green is 100% Mithraic because we either have the iconography or the inscription, which is in yellow. It's uncertain because the iconography is not very clear or just because associate, it was associated to the cult because something was already found in the past. And then in red, it's something that I completely discarded as not Mithraic at all. Um, so let's start with uh, the Tarraconense province. Um, here we have Can Modeler, which is uh, near Barcelona. And um, there was uh, an inscription that was found here. Uh, early on, but because it and the temple, uh, but unfortunately, uh, plundering and looting are not a great documentation of the earlier excavation uh, proved to be uh, very difficult to, to validate that hypothesis. But something that really uh, try to uh, verify or to validate uh, that proposition of this being a Mithraic uh, place of worship uh, beyond the inscription was the, found, was the finding of this altar fragment. It's made out of marble. And as you can see here, we have like two tiny heads that act like pulvini in, in the upper part of the altar. Um, it's very hard to identify. Some people try to match it to San Clemente altar with uh, Cautus and Cautopatus wearing Phrygian cups on their heads. But here we don't have Phrygian cups. Uh, we could identify that the head on the left is female because of the way that the hair is done. And we could say that the one on the right could be male. So could we be talking about the sun and the moon? Um, perhaps they are so deteriorated that actually they're both female. And we could be talking about, uh, I don't know, the seasons, or perhaps both are males, and we could be talking about the winds. And on one of the sides, there's also uh, this issue of really deteriorated decoration. But you could make out something like, uh, a mammal that could be a bull, perhaps, and you see like a flower or the sundial, and you can see uh, a vase and some jugs. So all of them could be symbols that evoke teachings of Mithraic origin, but we don't know for sure. I would say that this is a Mithraic find. And although we don't have a tauroctony here, uh, we could say that they are trying to evoke 
those notions that were uh, taught to only the initiated. And that's why we can't make sense of it, because we haven't been initiated. Um, but I will give you the fact that uh, they are very polysemic symbols that could mean anything. But because of the context of the finds, we could argue that they are uh, Mithraic indeed. This is another uh, object that was found, uh, a large vase of red porphyry uh, with snake decoration. We know that this motif is very, very popular in, in lots of Mithraic sites. For example, in Carnuntum, you have a wide variety of this, uh, of this, this pot. Uh, but again, we are not 100% sure. A massive finding uh, in last century, uh, or this century actually, uh, is the uh, Tarraconense uh, Elsmund Villa. It's the villa, the Roman villa of Elsmund. Uh, it was a very well documented villa, and suddenly a mithro uh, was found. And you can see here that it's, uh, you know, it has the uh, archetypical structure. It's a very long and narrow um, chamber with the altar. Uh, and the, I don't know if you can see my small arrow here of the mouse. I'm trying to point to the uh, head of the temple with a massive uh, area for the altar. And you can see that the temple, the, the long structure is, uh, is articulated into different spaces. You have an altar, you have um, a fountain. We have many inscriptions. Uh, we have also an epigraphic altars, and it's a, you can see that this space is trying to be uh, is trying to show you a, a hierarchy of the cult, and this has been found in many other Mithraea as well. Uh, unfortunately, the only iconographic bit, the only plastic representation recovered, uh, was this fragment of sculpture of marble, where it's possible. It is like a small cupid in front of a Venus. It could be that um, it's not, uh, for example, that iconography does not appear in the lexicon iconographicum. Um, nothing similar, nothing like that has been found in other Mithraea. Of course, we have lots of representations of Venus, uh, but it's very hard to find this specific iconography, especially because this was found um in a in a strata in a strata that was part of the filling up of the structure so did it actually belong to the mithraea or did it actually just belong to the rest of the decoration of the villa so it's very difficult to say uh this is an amazing uh, mithraea that was found in lugo in galicia uh, in the city of Vigo, within the city walls, uh, a large um, temple was found there with uh, a great inscription uh, by uh, a, a member of the of the army of the Roman army, and actually because it links that member of the army it could be linked to the same legion of the one uh, that we're going to see later on in Medida. It gives you the sense that the army was in fact uh, a very good agent when it came to disseminating the Mithras cult. You know that at the beginning, uh, all, all theories pointed at the um, army to be the main uh, dissemination agent in the Mithraic cult. And then it was, okay, perhaps it's not just the army, perhaps it's also all the officers of the uh, of the empire, also uh, the one in customs, um, just pure administration, and then it was the dominus with the slaves and so on. Uh, but here again, we are trying to uh, to highlight and emphasize the, the, the role of the army, especially because it was thought that because Spain was a, a pacata uh, province, it was uh, already pacified very early, that the army really didn't have a, a role in it. But we are, we are seeing this uh, can be, you know, otherwise. So this is just a recreation of the mm -hmm. temple because um, just fragments of metals were found that could have been part of the Tauroctony. 
but then again, we don't have an iconographic uh, material that we could show you uh, to to make emphasis to, to try to see the the actual representation, so the actual um, code or, or how it was encoded in in art and archaeology. The three tauroptonies that we have uh, in in Vertica are amazing uh, because. All of them serve to different purposes. For example, the really small altar in the Museo Arqueológico de Sevilla, uh, you can see that it's unfinished. And perhaps it's unfinished because of the not so great skills of the artist that, were, that was trying to carve it. Uh, you see that he started very low in the block, so he's not going to have enough space to finish the bull or to finish the leg of Paul Mithras. So that's quite unfinished. The good thing is that it's really small. So we could be talking about private devotion or we could be talking about a possible donation to a larger temple from one of the members of the cult. Um, the tiny and really uh, deteriorated uh, bust of Mithras that we have here, we have the, the upper body and just fragments of the legs uh, in the uh, Cordoba Museum. Um, this was misidentified first. I think it was identified as uh, Diana uh, because yes, it's a short tunic and uh, it's uh, depicting movement. So you could guess that you know it was uh, an honest mistake. And um, the the amazing thing about this tiny fragment is that it's from imported. It's made out of imported marble. So here we can talk about how rich or how big the purchasing power of the members uh, was. Um, another uh, another important thing to, to bear in mind is, uh, are we talking about the Mithras cult just for the elites or were all also slaves and um, I don't know, freedmen included? So, um, the, the, the richness of the material also can give you lots of clues. And the, this great uh, sculpture in the round uh, that it's now in the Cordoba Museum. And uh, the bad thing, the bad part of this, of this find, the bad news, is that it was found um, decorating a peristylium of a villa together with a sculpture of Bacchus. So should we be talking about uh, repurposing of a sculpture that was moved from its original place and then um, make it function as a decoration of a private villa? Or are we talking about someone who just liked the sculpture and decided to put it in his peristylum to, you know, to decorate his place? Um, I know that lots and lots of endeavours have been made to try to find the original Mithraeum where this sculpture could have been placed originally. Uh, but so far, the only thing we know for sure is that it decorated a villa, and that's it. Um, because of so many uh, tauroptonies were found in, in Andalusia, in Vetica, when this small altar surfaced, it was also associated uh, with Mithras because we have a bull and we have wheat and we have other vegetal motives. Uh, the truth is we don't have any other Mithraic context at all to link it. We don't have inscriptions. We are not sure 100% of where it was found. Um, so I wouldn't include this in the Mithraic catalogue. Uh, unless there was an inscription that was painted and now it's lost. Uh, we don't have any reason other than there's a bull uh, to link it to, to the Mithras catalogue. We know that there were many, many altars where we have bulls in Mithraic context, such as this one in Sibiu, but you, know, you have someone there uh, holding a torch and we know that either uh, Cautus or it's Mithras himself. So 
In this case, we don't have anything else that could attach it to the Mithras code, so I'm going to give it a pass. Another reason found, this fragment with uh, the, the head of the bull and some torches were found in, in Cadiz, in Andalusia, but then again, we don't have any other reason to link it to uh, Mithra's context. So I think this could have been uh, related to a local cult or even Magnamat, if you want, but not so much about Mithras because uh, Bukranian uh, is not a, a Mithraic uh, motive, per se. Here yeah, I've got some other examples of uh, Mithraic and non Mithraic uh, altars with Ukraine. And here is a very small uh, bust that I told about earlier on, on your right. Uh, and his curly hair, you can see even some solar rays, sun rays are coming from his head. Um, he's wearing a tunic with a fibula on one of the shoulders. So we know that's Mithras. Uh, the only thing is that he was portrayed like that uh, for a courage feeding. And um, the very bad news here is that we don't know where this uh, object is anymore. It's kind of lost in the mystery of history. Um, so hopefully one day it will resurface and we will be able to, uh, to study it uh, more thoroughly. And the drawing that I bring you from uh, Paris here is a fake. And I think that's amazing that in, in Spain there was such an interest in the mysteries of Mithras that they came up with a fake, with a forgery. And, um, and yes, we know it's a forgery and now even it's, it's lost, but I just thought it was, you know, a fun thing to show you. And here we have another example of the Mithras bust. So, so that I can show you that, you know, when it comes to iconography, it makes sense to make it part of the catalog, even if it wasn't part of the, of a temple, or even if it wasn't part of an altar, we can see that, great dissemination of the Mithras um, mysteries. So even if it wasn't for devotion, you have to think how popular was this cult? How public was this cult? How private? Why were some feetings decorated like that? So I think these are all questions that we need to answer one way or the other. Um, when it comes to extraordinary finds, I cannot leave out um, the great altar of uh, Troya in Portugal. This is an amazing find because it's on the coast of the Atlantic Ocean. So it's in the very farthest bit of the empire. And you can see here we have uh, the banquet, the sacred banquet of Mithras and the sun. And on the left, you can see a fragment of another scene, in this case, the Tauroctony. And uh, we know that because you have the bust of the moon on the upper part. And you can see uh, Cautes, uh, sorry, Cautopates on the left and the frontal leg of the bull. Um, uh, an oil also recovered as such to the just because it has the iconography of Helios. It's a debate, uh, doubtful, or it's not convenient 100% to associate something uh, so so popular and so no, so well known, such as the um, bust of Helios, to say it's, uh, it's myth-like 100% because it could be uh, for any other reason, uh, that decoration. So here we have this uh, this altar that some authors uh, wonder if this could be a triptych. So it would be in the middle of the Tauroctony, on the right, the, the sacred banquet, and perhaps on the left, the missing bit that we don't have, it could be either a uh, Mithras stealing the cattle or the sacred bull, or Mithras uh, performing the, the miracle of the water. And so on. Uh, we don't know. What I propose is that instead of a triptych, this could be a diptych. It's just, uh, you know, combining 
two very important things, two very popular things, very widely represented in all Mithraea, and we even know of some reversible double-sided altars. So perhaps this was, you know, their own interpretation of the events or of the liturgy uh, of the cult. So that could be another theory. Uh, in 2005, I think it was uh, a small a small place in in Medida was a very example with benches uh, by the walls and a small aisle in the middle. It was thought to be like the very first Mithraea uh, of of Medida. Um, it's hard to say that a Mithraeum was already documented in the first century AD in Merida. And that's because, again, we don't have uh, any inscriptions. And the only thing we have is this fragment of the altar. In this case, it's the base of the altar with polychromy. We have remains of the painting and the colors, they are very bright colors, red colors and green pigment. And uh, you can see the legs of someone standing up. Could it be Mithras? Why not? Uh, could be Alar? Why not? Could, could it be any other board? Yes. Um, that there, interestingly, an altar, a triangle altar in the shape of a bull head was also found in Merida. And here you have, uh, you know, here you have to question yourself, is it really Mithraic? Could it be more um, linked to Magna Mater? And so here we don't have Mithras depicted in the, in the altar, but we could have Atis instead. Um, so I think those are uh, research lines worth, it, uh, worth of exploring. And here I bring you the San Albin side uh, with the uh, bullfighting ring already built. And um, here, this is some of the sculptures that were found in the deposit. Uh, the ones that are framed in yellow, they are the ones that have very important information, such as the year that they were offered, which is 155 uh, of the Christian era. We have the name of the pater of the uh, of the community, and we also have the name of the main artist that uh, was in charge of delivering this program, this iconographic program. Um, so many inscriptions were found here, uh, no doubt at all about their Mithraic origin. Uh, but for example, uh, here in the upper line, we have the lion-headed god, which of course belongs to the Mithraic record. And then we have two figures, one with a snake um, circling his body, which could be a form of Ion, for example, or a representation of the time or the cyclic time and so on. Um, then we have another one, a, a very young man uh, wearing just a, a, a clamis and with a lion by his feet. So we have a lion head, uh, iron portrayal with a lion mask on his chest, and then we have this another guy uh, with a lion by his uh, by his uh, right foot. So we know how important the lion is, the, the great Leo, and how much, how many representations of lions we have in the Mithraic record. So of course, all three of them could be part of uh, of the Mithraic record. The only thing is that originally the one with the lion by his foot was interpreted as one of the um, as one of the data force, as scouted, while the other one in the lower register, which is holding something, was interpreted as cautopates. Um, women, females were left uh, out of the catalogue, and then many other representations were thought to be uh, of funerary origin and then belonging to that necropolis I told you about. Here made by uh, Demetrios. Demetrios uh, has been associated with the Aphrodisias work, um, workshop, and it seems that he also worked in Leptis Magna, as you can see from these examples that I'm bringing you today. 
Um, here we have Mercury and with that amazing inscription uh, on the lyre, and uh, which is also very interesting to see Mercury with a lyre uh, because it's not one of the most popular attributes in the Mithraic record. It could be the tortoise shell or the caduceus and so on, but never the instrument already built in. And here we have what I thought could be uh, Cautopates because he has the dolphin and dolphins has been linked to the ocean and the ocean as a liminal di uh, divinity and hence uh, death and afternoon and the end of life and uh, regeneration and so on. And we can see that uh, water and dolphins and um, the presence of water itself uh, has been linked uh, to Gautopates in other in other sites. Here are the sculptures I told you about the lion connection among these three uh, sculptures. I'm running because I don't want to exceed my uh, presentation time. And here we also have some uh, representations of Serapis and Esculapius. And um, that's why the first publication of this deposit was considered to be a temple dedicated to Oriental divinities more than just Mithras. Because of, you know, ha we have Serapis, we have Esculapius, we have Prosalute um, dedications. So um, it was hard to, to see, it was hard to make out what this temple was all about. But we have many, many other temples in the empire where you could see that Mithras is accompanied by Serapis, by Esculapius, and other Eastern divinities as well. Here we have uh, this uh, sculpture that was associated to the data force, to Cautus and Cautopatus, but he's holding a parasonium, he's holding a, a, a sword. So this iconography has been linked to, to Mars and to the, uh, um, sorry, uh, and to the sacred brothers, to Castor and Pollux. So we know that there's one representation of Castor and Pollux in the Mithraic record, but of course, easier because my every day of the god of their cult is one of the planetary gods that guard uh, the the ladder the mithraic ladder and of course here the, the female representation that should never be left out of the record even if we struggle to make sense of them uh they were part of the mithraic ladder they many uh, representations of magna mater luna um isis and so on were found in Mithraic record. We cannot cast them aside just because uh, women were not allowed to be part of the cult. Uh, we need to make sense of them and include all things that we find. So uh, because of the um, abundance of sculptures that we had in this deposit, and if you look at them closely, they are kind of the same um, volume, if you want, the same dimensions, and they are all uh, sculpted to be looked at from a, a frontal perspective. So for me, it was easy to see that they were all part of a, uh, of a repertoire, of a program, and perhaps they were all trying to be part of representing the whole uh, Mithraic ladder uh, so all the greats, we have Mercury, we have instead uh, the Luna was firstly identified as Isis, but we don't have any reason to identify it with Isis. Uh, we have Venus, uh, we have uh, Helios or the Sun, uh, we have Mars, and uh, we could have uh, Jupiter as well because one tiny fragment of, um, of an eagle was found, was recovered in the deposits of the theatre of, of Merida. And that's a very important thing because when the excavations began in Merida, there was su such a volume of finds that they decided to create like a deposit of all the finds in the, uh, the theatre. So this came up 
uh, in that deposit. So perhaps, you know, it was one of the more small fragments that came out from that uh, excavation from San Albin. And a colleague from uh, the Roman Museum uh, uh, in, in Merida uh, rediscovered, restarted this fragment because although um, uh, when Melida published his first uh, paper on the Mithraic finds, he says, oh, I felt like a, a big uh, drape fragment that could be associated with a fertility goddess and uh, some corns of wheat that, of course, this could be like, you know, uh, Keres or Kaibili or any other fertility goddess. But in fact, we know that this is part of the tauroctony of the temple. It was a massive tauroctony. And when it was recovered, the... Um, um, the clumis, it had red pigmentation in it. So it was painted, and we know that, uh, you know, a, a red clumis and mithras was a, a, a very a regular attribute. And those tiny fragments of animals were already restarted and reinterpreted. That could have been part of uh, the, the tauroptony as well, or they could have been votives uh, found in, in Merida as well. And this is an amazing job that the team from the National Museum had been carrying out, restarting and reinterpreted everything in the deposit. Uh, some oil lamps with possible uh, Mithraic decoration were also associated to the Mithras cult. And this is my take on the Mithraic uh, temple. And, uh, you know, luckily the, the Roman Museum was uh, um, an amazing partner to work with, and they welcomed new theories and new researchers. So, uh, if you go to the uh, uh, Roman Museum in Mar you, you could be watching this. You could be watching the reassemble all, of all the uh, Mithraeum in Mary there. And I just want to sh finish with this, and I'm going to be very, very brief. This was supposed to be a Mithraic uh, relief, but as you can see, uh, this is not Mithras being born from the rock, but this is uh, just uh, the Noah ark uh, popping out from, from the ark after the great rain. So with this, I thank you, really thank you for your time and apologies for exceeding my presentation time.